Sego, Wodkunu Alado, Kili Jungiats, Wakatahuni, Ganegehaga, Nyogo Uzodo. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Kili. I'm Wolf Clan, and I'm of the Mohawk Nation and part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The Haudenosaunee, which translates to the people of the Longhouse, also known as the Iroquois or the Six Nations, is one of the world's longest standing participatory democracies. Made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk, and Tuscarora Nations. Haudenosaunee youth are taught that we have responsibility to the next seven generations after us, because one day we will have to return the world to those we are borrowing it from, the ones who have not yet been born. This has been referred to as the seventh generation principle. This lesson keeps you humble and mindful, and you're reminded that you are not separate from nature, nor the most important thing to exist, but you still hold the power to be a revolutionist. The seventh generation principle is instrumental for all youth since they have the power to shape the future. They need to be given the chance to make this world better for their descendants. Indigenous knowledge, also known as IK, are powerful ways of knowing based on good relations with the planet that are dynamic and adaptive to the environments in which we live. Indigenous knowledge has both big picture lessons and hyper-focused information on how to live sustainably. With this knowledge, we recognize the negative effects of colonization, particularly its legacy of exploiting the land and water. Western-centric thinking often views the world as a resource to be maximized for profit. And one of colonialism's fundamental targets is the control of land and water. So certain ecosystems are more prone to degradation. Wetlands are a prime example, as these ecosystems are often viewed as a nuisance for Western development because you can't build or farm on a wetland. So, wetlands are often drained, filled, and dredged to create usable land. Even so, Western science, which is a body of knowledge that relies on the scientific method to understand and explain our world, views wetlands as critical ecosystems. Wetlands provide services to the environment and humans, such as purifying water, flood mitigation, habitat for endemic species of plants and animals, and storing mass amounts of carbon. They can even be used to help mitigate the effects of climate change. These ecosystems store floodwaters generated by intense storms, storms that will become more frequent as our climate continues to change. Wetlands are also one of the world's largest carbon sinks due to a lack of decomposition, which keeps carbon out of the atmosphere and stabilizes the climate. While this body of knowledge provides a valuable scientific way to look at wetlands, it often devalues and ignores indigenous knowledge even though native peoples have been living and stewarding the lands for tens of thousands of years. Indigenous knowledge can and should be used in answering today's questions, as indigenous peoples have been stewards of the land since time immemorial. Incorporating indigenous knowledge can inform better management of wetlands and, and other environmental projects to help allocate limited resources. This is supported through my own work. For my undergraduate research project, we used indigenous knowledge to inform standardized EPA wetland quality assessments. The EPA has standard assessments that determine the quality of a wetland and what to do with it. But a problem that often occurs is highly impacted wetlands get shoved to the back of the line, even if those types of habitats might be highly valuable for indigenous communities. In Akwazesne, my hometown in a Mohawk reservation about an hour and a half north on the border of so-called Canada and the United States, is around 12,000 acres, and much of the territory is wetlands. Anytime there is construction, the site will be drained and filled. Many wetlands located on the territory of Akwazesne have been highly impacted due to development or agriculture. Our chosen site was located off of a road that cuts directly through a wetland. The road is a massive barrier to the wetlands hydrology because of an inadequate number of suitably sized culverts to allow for proper water flow. That and the beavers like to clog up every culvert and outsmart the beaver deceivers. <laughs> to collect data on the territory, we needed permission from the St. Regis Mohawk tribe. We scheduled a Zoom meeting with the Environment Division and were given permission as long as we went out with tribal employees. Our data collection was to be used as a learning experience for tribal employees because we would be performing what is called an intensive vegetation assessment, where you have to identify plant species in the field from the tallest plants to the shortest plants. 
after we compiled our list of species from our field day in Akazasne and from 14 other sites throughout the Adirondacks that could be deemed pristine. 36 species were identified at Akwazasne and 179 species across the other 14 sites. For each species on our list, we found its biodiversity coefficient, which is a number that botanists have assigned to plants to indicate their affinity for particular habitats on a scale from 1 to 10. 1 meaning a plant will grow anywhere, and 10 a plant will only grow in very specific places. We then found the average of its biodiversity coefficients for each of the 15 sites with the Akwazasne site having a low average for biodiversity, and, the, and compared to the other sites, it placed third to last. To incorporate indigenous knowledge, we looked at the ethnobotanical properties of plants. This is the study of how humans interact with plants. For the purpose of our study, we focused on how indigenous people locally use plants. In many current vegetation assessments, there is a small list of plant species that are labeled as culturally important to native peoples, but that is usually as far as it goes. So, we created a new index of specific ethnobotanical properties by seeing it through the lens of medicinal, ceremonial, material, and food use. Each plant was then given a one or zero for each category. To do this, my mentor and I sat in a coffee shop for three hours flipping through a huge book called Native American Ethnobotany by Daniel Mormon. And he told me the properties that each species had for all 179 plants. With this information, we determined the percent for each ethnobotanical category across all 15 sites. This is where it gets cool. When looking at our new index, the Akwesasne wetland had the second highest percentage of ceremonially used plants. So it went from being one of the lowest priority sites based on just biodiversity to one of the highest for ceremonial uses. The other ethnobotanical categories for Akwazesne ranked either higher or the same as its biodiversity average. Including IK and environmental projects can improve the allocation of limited resources by reinforcing biodiversity values and creating equity for highly impacted systems. The study site in Akwazesne moved up in priority when indigenous knowledge informed the standard assessment while still showing that the biodiversity metric is a valuable index but can be improved. Wetlands are complex ecosystems with high variability. By including indigenous knowledge into these assessment practices, we ensure a more complete understanding of a wetland's place in the ecosystem and among people. Indigenous knowledge amplifies the idea that we are part of Earth and nothing is above anything else. Everything is sacred for the sake of its existence, not because it is useful or valuable. Indigenous people know that water is life and should be protect protected at all costs. We as humans need to stop putting the monetary value of resources above the well-being of all of our relatives who have existed alongside us, before us, and after us. The seventh generation principle should be brought into policy making with the hopes that decision makers will be more mindful of their roles in the long lasting effects that their decisions will have on the world and peoples to come. As we are part of seven generations past who thought about our future now, we need to make choices, laws, and policies with consideration of those who will come after us. Using knowledge cultivated over thousands of years can save this planet but it needs to be done properly through partnerships. This would exhibit strong support for native management and co-management practices and potential contributions towards land back initiatives for, for native peoples by returning land and stewardship rights. Meaningful partnerships and the land back movement support the self-determination of indigenous communities. Friendships and cooperation need to be established between Western scientists and indigenous communities because respecting indigenous people is what would make or break a strong relationship. These partnerships need to make space for knowledge keepers, but not speak for them. This also needs to be done with intention and openness and ensure that indigenous people will not be tokenized or culture appropriated. With this, there needs to be respect for knowledge keepers as legal shareholders of intellectual property. And they need to be given the freedom to share knowledge but also withhold information that is not appropriate for non-Native folks to know. Indigenous people 
and being in spaces of decision making and management opens doors for powerful change in our world to address our problems of today, like climate change and wetland degradation. Discomfort is the first step to improving multiculturalism in Western science, and scientists need to be open to an influx of multiculturalism in a space that has never had to hold space for people before. There's a lot of work to be done, and the fun is just starting, so how can you be a part of that change? Yawa, ji, wasa do, hunsa do de. Thank you for listening. <laughs>